church friends. And at one point, I heard a shout from upstairs. And the shout was, Dad, can we go to church early? Because our friends are going. I was like, we can't, because I've got lots of things to do, and I'm not going to get there early. And as it was, they didn't go early, the friends. Anyway, but I was like, how great is that, that my kids and other kids want to go to church early, not late. Some of us adults need to work on getting to church early and not late. You know, it's one of the things that we can do. But the kids want to come and have relationship with one another. You know, there is a great group of kids in this church, and they're building relationships with one another. You know, one of the things that I look back on my life, and, and I, I probably have the regret, is that I don't have any real friendships from my time at school. You know, I probably got one. And that's only because it's actually Abby's best friend, who I also went to school with the whole of my life. And that's the, the girl that kind of got Abby into church and kind of set Abby on her path towards, you know, where we are today. And Abby's still got a relationship um, with this lady. You know, they're both, we've all got kids now and stuff, and our lives have changed, but we've still got relationship. But I don't have that, but I want that for my kids. That, you know, they can look back and say, you know, when did you meet these guys? Well, I met them at church. These are my church friends, but these are my friends I do life with. You know, and you think, okay, what's that got to do with me? You, you may not have kids in this church. You may not have kids that are the age to attend kids' church. But you can do one of two things. You can join the kids' church team. Some of you have got time, skills, and capacity to do that. You know, because we always need teams. You know, we made a bold move of faith to open up another group without really the right human resources to do that because we knew we needed something for these older generation of kids. Or you can pray for the kids and our kids' church. Because, you know, Rick Warren once said that, you know, the hope of the world is the local church. But the hope of the local church is the children in church. Because too many churches get grey. And there's a few of them left. And they join another church. That church gets grey. They join another church. It gets grey. And they keep absorbing and absorbing and absorbing. Because there's no replenishment coming from the next generations. You know, we have four groups running in this church of kids from the ages of one all the way to 15. They are the next generation of people leading the church, people leading their community, people leading schools, business places, workplaces. But we have a responsibility as the family of God here to pray for them, to pray that the word of God is instilled in them. Because there'll come a time where they'll question church, faith, what they believe. You know, they'll, they'll have that moment, typically 13, 14, 15. Don't know about you, if you grew up in church, you probably had that moment. I certainly did. And I, I thought, nah, the church has got it wrong. I'm going to try the world for myself. I, I'm, I'm that type of person that goes, I don't believe you. I think I can make it work. Well, it doesn't work. Hence why I'm in church today. Thank goodness for that. But I hope my kids don't have to make that decision. But if they do, they know the place they come back to because they've got the depth of understanding of the word of God instilled in them. You know, even in my darkest days of being in flesh, sin, and whatever I was doing, I always knew there was another way. Always, because of what I learned in Sunday school. Because of the week after week of being dragged to church. And it was dragged. It was dragged, kicking and screaming. I made every protest I could possibly to get out of church. My one thing that worked was sport. You know, I managed to find that sport was on a Sunday morning. I was like, hooray, I got out of church. But actually, you know, I wish I hadn't. I wish I'd stayed with my, because the guys that stayed in church, you know, they're doing some wonderful things now. And they've got that close friendship. You know, the guys I played rugby with, do I talk to any of them today? No. Did we have a great time in the moment? Yeah, but is, did I build lifelong, lasting relationships that are enhancing me and my relationship with one another? No. But that's what the kids can get as they grow up and do church and life together. So, you know, I want to encourage you. If you find you've got capacity, it's just one Sunday a month, one in four, one in five, to maybe serve and work with the kids team. We're not saying you're going to suddenly lead the program and be teaching and you've got to have your doctrine all together, know everything, and you can teach them every verse of the Bible. Sometimes we just need you as a body in there so that the leader can focus on leading and you can be ushering and shepherding loose sheep, as they often can be, in the various different ages. But we've all got the responsibility to pray because we need to see this next generation ready to start taking this world by storm. You know, the world is in a mess right now. 
You know, and we need a generation of Christian kids being raised up, ready to go and influence their schools, ready to go and influence the people around them, colleges, universities, workplaces, whatever that may be, ready with the defense of the gospel at hand, ready to say, now this is what I believe. I'm going to stand up for what I believe. And too many people outside of church are standing up for what they believe and they're making a big noise about it. But we need the Christian church to stand up and say, no, this is what we believe. It may go against what you think, but this is what we believe. And it comes from the kids learning about Jesus Christ in church. Week after week, hearing the truth, building friendships and relationships with one another, seeing their parents doing the same thing, seeing how their parents interact with one another as a church family and going, Yeah, I want a bit of that. Yeah, I want to be like mum and dad. Yeah, I want relationships like mum and dad have got relationships. I want relationships like these guys. And being inspired when we hear of people hitting 40, 50, 60 years of marriage. Now, that should inspire us and our kids to say, this is what I want. I want a piece of that. And we have the responsibility to pray. As the church, it's our responsibility to pray. Nothing in this church is born without prayer. You know, and there's been moments, and I remember in the early prayer meetings where it was just maybe Peter and Rob or just a few of us praying desperately needing some sort of youth. And we've got it. T412. It's taken a number of years. It was birthed in that place of just desperate prayer for God going, we need youth in this church. We need the next generation being ready to, ready to rise up. So, you know, as you see the kids running around, they will make noise. They will try and trip you over. They will get in your way. If they're my children, they'll probably either be really louder in your face or suddenly cower and look like they've got no ability to talk and then suddenly they'll shout at you because that's what my children like to do. You know, Eve is very much that way. She'll either be super confident or like that. You never know what reaction you're going to get from her. But they are the future. The church is the hope of the world and the kids are the hope of the local church. We need to have local churches just growing and growing with generations. You know, the vision of this church is a multi-generational. Every age, from the youngest to the oldest, and we need everyone involved. So, you know, I encourage you, have a think about, can you serve in the kids' church? But if you can't, make sure it's on your list of daily prayers, or that when you spend time to pray about the church, make sure you are praying for the kids' work, because they are the hope of this town, of our schools, and for our nation, is that we have kids that rise up and ready to take the leadership roles that God has destined them to have. So hopefully that encourages you, because it encourages me as I see them running around having friendships with one another, desperate to get to church early. Now, how many of you would, if your friend said, oh, I'm going to go to church early, be like, oh, yeah, now I'll see you there at 10.30. They wanted, they were begging me to get to church early. I had a good reason this morning not to, and thankfully I didn't, because there wasn't church early. But, you know, let's create relationships that we want to get there early, just to see the people we do life with. And encounter God in the morning. But right now, it's my privilege to invite Pastor Rob, who is going to come and share the word of us. Thanks, John. Good on you, man. Lucy, have a, have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful day. Uh, you know, I was just thinking, when you're talking about kids' church, <laughs> and I saw who was up here in stage, and I, I thought, where's my missus this morning? My, my wife is actually in kids' church. She's, she's one of the helpers this morning. And then I looked at Superman this morning. Who was in that Superman costume? That's uh, Jonathan Sweetman. And I don't know if that's his first time doing this this morning, but uh, he's a seasoned preacher. He preaches in several other churches around about East Sussex and beyond. But kids' church isn't too small for him to serve in. Every now and again, uh, I have someone say to me, Rob, I'll do anything, just don't ask me to do kids' church. And... Um, when I first came to this church, there was already an assistant pastor and his wife uh, had been set in place before I came. This is like 20 odd years ago. And uh, my first conversation with them about, you know, various roles, they came out and said, well, um, we'll do anything. Just don't ask us to do kids' church. So guess what I asked them to do? And you know what? Like when I was asked to do kids' church, Back in Australia, my wife and I, I found to my amazement after two weeks, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I really look forward to it. And when it really paid off was when those kids wrote me letters years later saying, thank you so much for putting up with me. Forgive me for for the days I was a, a real headache, but thank you. That's what makes it worthwhile. Even if you don't get any letters, it's still worthwhile. Amen. I just want to do one more thing before we... Uh, start a message, a little bit more of a uh, serious thing, very serious, really. You're probably aware 
of what's been going on in, uh, in Iran right now. The young lady, 22-year-old, was killed because she protested about having wear here. And uh, I remember one, I won't mention his name, but uh, a great ministry that operates uh, in and around Iran. He said that the, uh, that uh, move of God and that collapse of that regime, it will come through the women. It's going to be the women folks that will finally say we've had enough. And um, there's a lot of stuff going on right now in Iran. Uh, chief amongst them, the fastest move of God on the planet is happening in Iran right now. There are more people getting saved in Iran than anywhere else on the planet. It's all underground. I say all these things because I know these things because I have about between 10 and 15 Persians in this church at any one given time who have fled that regime. And they asked me this morning, Rob, would you please ask your people, would you pray for my nation? Can we do that this morning? Come on, let's stand up and let's, let's really believe that Jesus Christ is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that he raises kings up and he sets kings down. Jesus is the one who's instrumental in regime change. But right now, somehow in God's vast economy, he is working something out in that nation. I don't doubt that that regime will fall one day, but somehow or another, he is working in that. Prayer is a vital, vital part of what allow. when I say this, God is sovereign, but Prayer fits in there somewhere, or else Jesus wouldn't have told us to pray, your kingdom come, your kingdom come, and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If, if it all was just going to pan out, just because God is 100% sovereign, somehow I think because of Jesus telling us to pray that prayer, your will be done on earth. There's got to be somewhere in all of that economy for the church's prayers to figure prominently in what goes down. Amen? So let, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we lift up the nation of Iran. We lift up God, our own Iranians, and their families, their spouses, their children, all, that they, all the people they knew that they no longer know because of what's happened. So God, we, we ask you to reassure them that Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords and is working things out. Father, we just believe for you that your kingdom would come, that your will would be done in that part of the earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom is a kingdom of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And so, Father, we pray for a, a, a continuation of you working out righteousness in the hearts of that nation, the hearts of the Iranians in that nation, Lord. All those Persians, work it out, we pray, in Jesus' mighty name. And let the light of the house of God so shine, even as we saw last week, let it shine like a city that cannot be hid. And so let the glory of God in every believer's heart, let it be put in a lampstand that all who come into that particular grouping would see the light in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Have a seat. Yeah. So th this morning, uh, my message is titled, God is on your side. Turn to somebody and say, with the emphasis on your side, Turn to somebody and say, God is on your side. This is a, as you'll see, this is a truth that I have been running on all the days of my life. And I want to show you the scriptures for this. I want to show you the biblical basis for it. But I want, I want you to leave this place confident that whatever is going on in your life, God is on it. We read in Romans 8, if God before you... Who can be against you? If God be for us, who can be against us? And let me just show you. I'm going to back that up with a whole bunch of other, uh, other scriptures. So God is on our side. I just need to tell you a little bit about my story. Up until my family emigrated to Australia in 1972 when I was 12 years old, we lived in a small coal mining village called Blackwood, Near, I've actually never put the two things together. <laughs> Coal mining, and it was called Blackwood. 
Anyway, it was near Glasgow in Scotland. At that time, there was only one sport played in small mining villages in Scotland, and that was football. We played football morning, noon, and night. The football we played at noon was in the school's football pitch every day at school. And after the school dinner bell rang, all the lads would head down to the football pitch where we would pick two captains. And after tossing a coin, they would proceed in turns to pick their team. You here, you here. In the early days, I was always one of the last to get picked. Yes, that's right. I was hoping for a note of the violin just then. The first one to be picked was always a lad called Robert Dunbar, otherwise known as Bori. All right, so I'm going to refer to him from now on as Bori. I don't know why he was called Bori, but that was his name. This kid was regarded as being, by everybody, as destined to play in the Scottish Premier League, or in that day, Division One. And everybody, all of us lads, we expected that one day he would play for Glasgow Rangers. He was so much better than us. His his whole skill set was so much better than all of us. And everyone, everyone, every lunchtime, everyone knew that whichever team Bori was on would invariably win the lunchtime football match. For the most part, it was a foregone conclusion. Morale on the opposite team would always be much lower because Bori was on that team. Expectations of losing on the opposing team were very much high. So whichever side Bori was on pretty much decided the match. Well, I want to tell you that we have in life, we have got someone who sometimes Bori is team lost. Not often. But I want to tell you that we have got someone on our team who has never lost, will never lose a battle, who is on your side, and his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. And with him on your side, friends, he will see you through every one of life's difficulties. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them from them all. Psalm 118, verses 6 through to 7, it literally says the Lord is on our side. Verse 6, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can mere man do to me? The Lord is on my side. He's among those who help me. Let me know the angels help us too. Let me know I'd help you as well. Therefore, And as we say, if you see a therefore, check out what it's there for. Therefore, I will look in triumph on those who hate me. So the Lord Jesus, in that sense, he's our body. Amen. He's not just on our side, though, guys. He's not just on our side. He's our captain. Hebrews 2.10 tells us this. It says, for speaking of Jesus, it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom all things are made, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. The captain of our salvation, Jesus Christ, made perfect through sufferings. Wow. So he's not even, he's not just only on our side, he's the captain of our salvation all the way through. He's the author of it. Amen. Amen. He's the one that drew you to himself. He's the one that caused you to see the cross, what he was doing on the cross. He was the one that gave you the realization. He did rise from the dead and put faith in your heart to believe it. So he's the author and the developer of our faith. The writer to the Hebrews actually quotes Psalm 118 verse 7, just in case the devil was able to tell you in the last two minutes, well, that's Old Testament. Our God doesn't change from one testament to the other. All we get is a fuller revelation as we move from one covenant to the other. Are you with me? Jesus being the the, the fullness of the revelation of God. So the writer to that 
the, the book of Hebrews, Psalm, he quotes Psalm 118 verse 7. And, and his purpose is to encourage and exhort these persecuted Jewish Christians, Hebrews, to not quit their faith. It was so difficult. They were under so much persecution. And years gone by, they had lost everything. But they had got the pearl of great price in their hearts. Amen. They found the treasure hid in a field. Are you with me? So he was encouraging them to continue to run the race before them, following their captain, Jesus. But their morale was very, very low. But he reminds them that God is on their side. And he asks them, come on, what can man do to them? Hebrews 13, verse 6, it says this in verse 6, so we take comfort. Come on, think about that. So we take comfort. Do you need comfort this morning? In the midst of what's going down in your life? In the midst of life's trials? Are you pained because a, a relationship is broken down? Are you pained because you've, there's some sense of loss in your life? Are you worried because there's a time of transition in your life this morning? No. So we take comfort and are encouraged and confidently say, everybody say, say. It, you notice it doesn't just say think. This is what we got to get our, we have really got to get our heads around how faith operates. Faith operates by believing in your heart and speaking out of your mouth. Faith doesn't gain traction until it, belief is in there, but for faith to gain traction, for, to get hold of God and, and get God moving in your life, you've got to say it or sing it. Just get it out of your mouth. If there's one psalm that I have, I even made up my own chord progression for it in the guitar, because many were the afflictions of this person. And I would just get that guitar around my neck and just make up, you know, I wouldn't make the words up, I would just say, the Lord is my helper, I shall not fear. What can man do to me? But it's got to get out of your mouth. You can sit there till now to Christmas, until Jesus comes back just thinking about it. But you've got to believe in the heart and speak with your mouth. How do you get saved? Just by believing in the heart? No, there's got to be a declaration of what you believe in your heart to get saved. And that is not a formula, but that is the nature of faith all the way through. Until those promises are vocalized in praise and thanks and affirmation, sometimes prophesied, our faith won't do anything. Do you hear what I'm saying? Are you with me? This, this is why the devil hates faith. He hates any mention of faith because it, it connects us with God. So don't be surprised if, as you travel through YouTube and all the other various formats, don't be surprised about various sites that really, really lay into faith. So he says, so we take comfort and we're encouraged and confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Oh, wow. When you think of all the fears in life, when you think of the trepidation in life, the anxiety and, and worry, all expressions of fear. And look at the levels of anxiety in society today. I too, myself, in years gone by, 10 years ago, I went through a period of extremely high anxiety. I, friend, if you're here and you're suffering from anxiety, uh, I, I tell you what, I can identify with that. Mm -hmm. But I want to say to you, what got me out of it? Counteracting the fear with the truth here. Counteracting all the anxiety by, by believing what is written here. And more than believing it, saying it. Confessing it. Praising God for it. Singing about it. Thanking Him for it. All vocalizations of the promises of God. Amen. So we take comfort. Are you comforted this morning? Are you encouraged this morning? I hope you can, you've got enough faith in your heart that your attitude would be, if the Bible says it, that settles it. I hear other people saying, if the Bible says it and I believe it, that settles it. Now, friend, whether you believe it or not, the Word of God still settled. <laughs> I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? 
Many years later, I'm talking about after that first lesson I got through football, many years later, in 1997, I was traveling with Pastor Morris Ritchie. Now, you met Pastor Morris and his wife, Wendy, here recently. Do you remember the blonde-haired guy? He might own up and say it's gray, but it used to be blonde. Do you remember they were up in state? Okay. So, in 1997, and you might remember me thanking him for introducing me to missions. Well, that first mission I went with uh, Pastor Morris Ritchie was to the Ukraine. And we were in the Ukraine, and we'd been invited to spend a day and a night with a young Ukrainian family, father, mother, two kids. And they, funny enough, they lived in a small Ukrainian mining village. The difference was it was a lot more noisy because it was open cut mine and there was dynamite going off every, every day at lunchtime. And it was in that setting that the Lord taught me another very valuable lesson through football. I kind of thought, mm, is this really going to go down with the ladies in this audience? But friend, there's just as much TV focus on women's football now. Isn't that right? It's like women's football is just as popular as men's football. So I thought, yeah, I'm going to use football as an illustration. Is that all right, ladies? Now, the family had a 10-year-old son. And, and once we'd all had lunch together, he came up to me with a plastic football game, and I, I put a picture of it, just like that. You ever played in one of those? Now everybody's online. You can still buy these, by the way. I saw them for sale on, on Google. But this is pretty much what he, he was holding this in his arms, and he said, that, he says, oh, would, would you play with me? You know, he, his, his sibling was a sister. And he says, he says, would you play with me? And I says, yeah, man, no problem. So um, I said, sure. Well, I, he put the thing down, and I'll tell you, this kid was destined for the plastic football game premiership. <laughs> the Premier League. I couldn't believe it. I played those games. He won every single game. And, I, and I, despite the fact I was in ministry and you know, had a t t t the role of pastor, I found myself getting a bit frustrated. <laughs> and, and that kind of, I don't know about you, but I... There's no such thing to me as a game. It's like I play to win. I don't care if it's the wife or whoever, I will play to win. And I'll make sure they stick to the rules as they're written, yeah? So don't tell me it's just a game. <laughs> so this was starting to arise in me. And, uh, and I, I, I kind of five minutes went past, ten minutes went past, fifteen minutes went past. And every time I tried to kick off from my goal line, the ball would go up the the, the thing over there, go towards his end, and then gradually, slowly trickle back, and I'm flicking and flicking and flicking, and this, this ball would go into my own net. I, the, he, the reason he won was not so much that he was scoring goals, I was scoring own goals right, left, and center. I thought, what, what is going on here? And he, after every own goal, this 10-year-old kid would split his sides laughing, and he ah! <laughs> you did it again. Oh, I love their own goal. And I thought, oh, dear me. Then after 15 minutes on this losing streak, and in, with my frustrating building and my morale sinking, ever been there in life? <laughs> the kid laughing his head off. He finally owned up and told me the truth. All the time I'd been playing with him, he showed me this, all the time I'd been playing with him, he, I had not been playing on a level playing field. <laughs> what he'd done was he'd got some cardboard and he'd got two layers of cardboard and put it under his end. So there was a slight tilt. I thought, you sneaky little boy. <laughs> you sneaky little boy. I kind of saved my pride a little bit. But I thought, and you know, in that moment, it's like a, I kind of got a revelation. In that moment, I, I won't say I felt the Lord speak to me, but boy, the light went on. You know how sometimes God talks to you and it's just like a sudden realization, a sudden connection, yeah? A sudden kind of cross-referencing. And in that moment, I suddenly saw that through Jesus and his cross 
and his resurrection that God had provided me with an unlevel playing field in my favor. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? And in that moment, I also saw that the devil had scored the greatest own goal of history. <laughs> you don't say, what do you mean? The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 through 8, it basically says that if the devil had known what he was doing in terms of whipping up that crowd that cried out, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate washes his hands of the whole affair and Jesus is led off to be crucified. And the devil thought, I've won, I've won. He'd, he'd made his play, he'd made, a, he'd made a play and he thought he'd won. But friend, on the third day, God made his own play and raised Jesus from the dead. <laughs> and in killing in killing Jesus on the cross, in inciting the, the hatred towards Christ, whipping the crowd up behind like those cries of crucified, there was every devil in hell also crying out, crucify him, crucify him. But he had, he had kicked that ball into his own net, and there was no way back. That, that was final. There was no rematch. No need for a rematch. Jesus had gained a victory, Amen. Christ had gained the victory. And now, he's on your side. Amen. And you think before you were saved, you think how unlevel the playing field was. You might have had a suspicion there was a, a devil. You probably were questioning, what is life about? There was, you know, is there any meaning? Is there any purpose? Maybe you can remember terrible times of, of, of loss and, and stress and anxiety and ill health and you felt all alone. You might even had friends and family, but oh my, you felt overwhelmed by life. But then somehow somebody told you the gospel or you read it or you saw it on a YouTube video. You, you came in contact with the good news of the gospel. Eh? And Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, he drew you to himself. And then you had that moment, didn't you? That you had that revelatory moment where you thought, man, this is true. Christ is a, Christ is a historical figure. Wow, and, and Christ, that was God in the flesh. Wow, that was God come down to this planet to reveal God to humanity in a human body. And then, and then you, under, you understood in that moment that what his life was about. He's working, he never sinned once. He was perfectly innocent when he went up on that cross, an innocent man, but he was carrying our sins. He committed no crimes of his own, but boy, we had. How many commandments had you broken? You hear what I'm saying? And Jesus carried all their sins on that cross and died. But friend, if God hadn't got into the play there and raised him from the dead, we'd still be in our sins. But Christ was raised from the dead and you believed it. Well, the vast majority of you in here, you believed it. And that unlevel playing field, friend, that unlevel playing field, a bit like this, you hear, <laughs> the devil here, sin here, fear of death, hell and the grave here, ignorance of God here. But then you believed, friend. You believed, and now the playing field of life is tilted in your favor. Amen. It's tilted in your favor. And if you read your Bible and believe it and you pray, guess what? Every time the devil tries to kick the ball into your, your net, guess what? It's going to trickle back into his own. Amen. Amen. If you, if you don't tinker with sin, uh -huh, you, you've done with that. You're going to do your best to live for righteousness' sake, yeah? The devil's hoping you'll play around with sin because he can kind of turn this around a little bit. Uh, you hear what I'm saying? And when you tinker with sin, you get condemned and you feel guilty and you feel shame. And that's not really the atmosphere or the mindset to pray in faith. Mm -hmm. So it's a bad mistake to play around with God and tinker around with sin because the devil can use that. Do you hear what I'm saying? 
He can't steal your salvation from you, but friend, he can, he can turn the tables again, experientially, if not legally. Are you with me? Are you getting this? Wonderful. So Jesus gained the victory. 1 John 2.14 says this. He says, I've written to you, young men. Give me, a, give me a, an arm. Raise your arm for your young man in here. Very good. All the men put their hands up. He says, he says, he says, he says, he says I've written to you, young men, because you're strong. And the word of God abides in you. That's why you've got to read your Bible. If you don't read your Bible, you can't apply that to yourself. You'll be weak. If you don't read your Bible for seven days, it will make you weak. That went completely over the head of a lot of people. But look what it goes on to say. I've written to you, young man, because you're strong. And the word of God abides in you. And you have overcome the wicked one. You have. It doesn't say you shall. You have overcome the wicked one. Legally, through all that Christ did in the cross and the resurrection, yeah? And I would say because of the truth that I've just told you, that in life, in life after your salvation, you overcome the wicked one every single time. Amen? If your heart is set towards God and his righteousness. Amen. So the devil is the... He's always kicking own goals. He's kicked the greatest own goal in history. But just to illustrate the fact that he's always kicking own goals, can you think of an own goal that he kicked in the Old Testament? And it's a perfect example of this. Do you remember in the days of Queen Esther? This is Old Testament times. Queen Esther, she had an uncle. His name was Mordecai. And he had an arch enemy called Haman. Not Haman, but Haman, he had an arch enemy, so much so that this Haman plotted against Mordecai with the intention of hanging him on a new set of gallows. Your gallows is where you hang people, yeah? And he had set up these gallows. And in the end, through the queen's intercession and the people praying and fasting, God was able to turn that situation around and Haman himself was hung in his own gallows. Read the story in the book of Esther. It's a wonderful picture of the devil yet again scoring a, what we used to call an og. Did you English guys call an own goal an og? No, we used to call them ogs. So the devil is the master of the og. It's a, good way to, it's a good way to picture the old devil. I don't give him much thought, to be honest. I know he's there. I understand what he can get up to. Uh, but I keep my focus on Jesus. Yeah. But you think about, ladies and gentlemen here, think about when you see like a cup final, the UEFA Cup or whatever, some, some big FA Cup. Have you seen the face of the player at the penalty shootout, who loses the World Cup, European Cup, FA Cup, because he missed the goal? Have you seen his face? Inconsolable, isn't it? Friend, the devil is a loser. Amen? I hope that's the picture you have of him. I hope you, had, I don't, I hope you don't have the small God, big devil picture. Many Christians give more glory to the devil than God. Oh, the devil did this, and the devil did that, and the devil's here, and he's got me in here. And oh, I'm thinking, really? Have you met Jesus? I think you'll find he's God. Amen? So, that lesson was so valuable for me. I didn't know it then, but in a few short months, I was going to be taking on the role of full-time mission director for our church movement. And that involved going to many different nations for many different purposes, but chiefly into the Ukraine. And I'll tell you, over those four years that I was a full-time mission director, man, I'll tell you, I ran, I ran into a lot of opposition. I ran into a lot of people who did not like me, didn't like what I was doing. We ran in a, we ran in a bunch of stuff. But I want to tell you, I never forgot that football game with that young lad. 
every single time I said, thank you, Lord, this is tilted in my favor, despite what it looks like. Why? Because of what you did, you are on my side. If God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. But friend, I want to tell you, this, this turning of the tables, this retilting of the table in our favor, it's about far more than the devil being defeated. Oh, hang on. I want to tell you one more thing that the devil got defeated on. You want to hear this one? What about the fear of death? Let me read this scripture to you from Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through to 15. It's all very well for young people to say, oh yeah, Jesus delivered me from the fear of death. No worries. Wait till you're 80 and 90 years old. When, when the reality of that, or you come up against a disease where the prognosis ain't real good, like I did at the start of this year, where I, you know, they tell me, oh, well, Mr. Smiley, it, it, uh, it could be prostate cancer. But the Lord had already spoken to me in accident and emergency. And he, he gave me a scripture as I was lying there in agony. He gave me a scripture and says, thanks be unto God who always leads us in triumph. <laughs> It wasn't until later I thought, yeah, I could have died and that would have been true. <laughs> because we're talking about a triumph over death, hell, and the grave. Amen. So let's look at this, Hebrews 2, 14 to 15. It says, since therefore these his children, you and I, we share in flesh and blood in the physical nature of human beings, he himself in a similar manner partook of the same nature, the incarnation, that by going through death he might bring to naught and make of no effect him who had the power of death, that is the devil. And also that he might deliver and completely set free all those through, what does it say? All those through the haunting fear of death were held in bondage throughout the whole course of their lives. If you're not a Christian, well, the Bible tells us if you're not a Christian, it's like that fear of death is just going to be around you, isn't it? And the reason people are afraid of death is because they don't know what's beyond death's door. But we know what's beyond death's door, don't we? we the Bible tells us what is beyond death's door. We can either go to be with Christ in heaven because we are clothed with the righteousness of Christ, or we will depart this world into a dark place called hell or Hades. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, everyone is going to be resurrected and there's going to be the separation. We, the righteous, will go to be with Christ forever. Amen. And, but those who have refused the gospel, those ones that turned their back in Christ, that that's somehow just all their life just pushed it down, just suppressed the truth, is that they, they're going to hear some terrible words and it's depart from me. And they will go into hell. You hear what I'm saying? And the reason, the reason why this fear of death had to be dealt with was because it had haunted mankind for millennia. They just didn't know what was beyond death's door. And to make matters worse, everyone knew they'd done stuff. Everyone's conscience was stained with sin and laced with guilt and shrouded in shame. So anyone that was approaching death's door was acutely conscious of all the wrong that they had done. So they kind of expected nothing good beyond death's door. They, they expected to be punished beyond it. Wow, what a situation Jesus has delivered us from. He's borne all our sins. He's borne all our shame. We are free to go. Amen. But oh my goodness, if you're not a Christian, if you have never believed, Friend, if you're in this place and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, if you've never vocalized your faith in him, if I could persuade you, I could. And I pray that by the grace of God that the Holy Spirit imparts enough amazing saving grace to you today that you would make a decision for Jesus. Amen. So we've dealt with the devil. We could have made a series out of this, but I thought we could bring it into land without making a series about it. But friend... Our, our level playing field, our, uh, sorry, our unlevel playing field, Jesus has done more than just defeat the devil. 
How many of you know he's also defeated sin? Now, there's an enemy without. That's the devil. But friend, I want to tell you, there's a bigger enemy within. And that is our propensity towards sinful behavior. Do you hear what I'm saying? Jesus had to do something, had to provide something that would allow us to change a lifestyle of self-serving sin. He had to change our hearts. And isn't it wonderful we can be born again and receive a new spirit and a new heart that's inclined towards righteousness? But we still got the old flesh, don't we? We still get that old thing though. But how many know what Jesus did about that? Let's go to Romans 6, if we can. Let's go to Romans 6. I don't know about you, but my biggest problem is not the devil. My biggest problem is the old Rob Smiley. But then I keep reminding myself of Romans chapter 6. Look what it, look what it says. This is verses 1 to 4. Then to keep it short, verses 12 to 14. 14, 12 to 14 being the conclusion of what you read in 1 to 4. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Some argue that the more we sin, there'll be more grace. Nah, certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, King Jamie says, don't you know that your old man was crucified with him? Oh, thank God for that. And if you've been through your water baptism, you can stand on that water baptism every time your old man tries to haunt your house. Every time the suggestion comes from your flesh, your desires, or whatever, whatever that temptation is to go back and do what you used to, you can say, I've been to my own funeral. Mm-hmm. I've been to my own funeral. That old man, sinful old man, was nailed to Christ's cross, and we buried him in the waters of baptism. Amen. Wow. And we need, to, we need to keep that in view because all of us have temptation. All of us, sometimes all of us, we, we, there's this temptation to kind of go back into default settings. Mm-hmm. Sinful default settings. Selfish default settings, yeah? Fearful default settings. Unbelief default settings. But friend, your old man was crucified with him and buried in the waters of baptism. It goes on. Here's the conclusion of that chapter. He says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. That you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members or your faculties, mental or otherwise, do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead. That's, that's now. And your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under law, but grace. So there's grace. There's truth. And as we put our faith in the truth, God will give the grace to walk in all of that. Amen. So that when it comes to the, the playing table of life, not only has Jesus dealt with the devil, he's dealt with that that always causes misery because sin is what causes human misery, selfishness, greed, lust. You hear what I'm saying? Just a couple more, just quickly. One of the greatest enemies of the people of God is a lack of knowledge. The Old Testament declares, my people, 
this is God speaking through the prophet, my people are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. In those days, it was a lack of knowledge of the law and, and God's economy, how he dealt with human beings. But friend, you and I have a Bible, Old Testament and you. You and I have got connect groups. You and I have got access to Sunday sermons. And everybody else is thanks to the internet. There's a, there's, there really is no need to lack knowledge. Do you hear what I'm saying? There's no need for us to be in a position of ignorance where the devil can take advantage of that or life just works through our ignorance and we end up defeated. There's no need for that. Are you with me? And the same goes not just for knowledge because it takes more than knowledge. It takes wisdom. Proverbs tells us this, that, and this, this is, holds true for men as well. It says, every wise woman builds her house. So that, that can talk about marriage, family life, business life, you name it. Every wise woman builds her house, but the foolish one tears it down with her own hands. And I think we could all put our hands in the air and say, yeah, I've acted foolishly. Either in the realms of finance, bad investments, never saved, never really got a grip on budgeting. Or we chose the, we knew we were choosing the wrong partner and we went through hell for a while. Do you hear what I'm saying? We, so, we make so many foolish decisions. But friend, you and I have got access to God's wisdom. James 1 verses 5 through to 7. One of my most common prayers this. Because sometimes I don't know what to say to a person. I've never dealt with that situation before, perhaps pastorally. And I need to be careful with my words. I need to be careful with my timing. I need to be careful with how I say it. If we're talking about relational issues. But in any case, whatever the issue, James 5, sorry, James 1, 5 to 7, if any of you, how many know we're all included? If any of you is deficient in wisdom, in other words, we're short on the big W questions, what, when, why, or the big H question, how am I going to do it? If any of you is deficient in wisdom, let him ask of the giving God who gives to everyone liberally and ungrudgingly without reproaching or fault finding. God's not going to call you dumb. Hello? He's going to give you, because you were humble and you sought him, he will give you wisdom. So without reproaching or fault finding, and it will be given him. Let me continue. Only it must be in faith that he asks with no wavering. No hesitating, no doubting. For the one who wavers, hesitates and doubts is like the billowing waves a surge out at sea that is blown hither and thither and tossed by the wind. For truly let not such a person imagine that he will receive anything he asks for from the Lord. Let me show you how that works. This is how I pray. I said, Lord, I don't know how to deal with that. I've, can't, I've got some experience, Lord, but this is a, this is a different situation. Um, mm, I, I need some help with the big W questions on this, and I need some help with the big H. How am I going to go about it? Are you with me? So then I pray in faith, and I say, Lord, at the moment, yeah, kind of got a couple of ideas, but uh, I'm asking for your wisdom, and I believe I receive it right now. And in the coming minutes, hours, and days, some situations require action straight away. Some, some you can leave it, yeah. So, Lord, whether it's minutes, hours, or days, I thank you, Lord, that I'm going to be walking in the wisdom by the time I get to the point where I need to make a decision. That's faith. That's asking in faith. Let me show you what asking double-minded is, is making the same prayer and then going, oh, dear, what am I going to do? I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I better do something. I'm going to do that, that is just not faith. Do you hear what I'm saying? Faith believes, yeah, the wisdom's going to download as I go. Where there's, where there's no faith, it's just a continuation of the fear of getting it wrong. Fear. Oh, I'm all alone. Oh, where can I go? That, that's, you, you hear what I'm saying? So, again, that's a way where the devil would kind of use that to tilt it back the other way. The playing field of life. But if God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. I could go on, but I think that's pretty much wraps it up.
Come on, let's stand up and thank the Lord. Come on, let's thank Jesus. Give him a huge clap. Come on. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. You are for us. Who can be against us? We boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I shall not fear. What can mere man do to me? Lord, you're in my side. You're amongst those that help me. The angels help me. You help me. I have brothers and sisters who help me. Oh, Lord, thank you that you're in my side. That settles it. That means we're coming through this. That means that we're going to win in this situation. God, that's it. You are on my side, the captain of my salvation. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's put our hands together. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 No own goals for us. All right? No own goals for us. Jesus has scored the winner, and we just join him. Amen. Folks, I, uh, I just want to open up this altar right now uh, because one of the other areas that I haven't got time to go into is this, is that from the way I read the Bible is that I, I believe that God also got the victory over sickness and disease. I have been a Christian now for 37 years. I've heard other arguments saying, no, he didn't. I've looked at it three times over those 37 years in depth, and I've come to the same conclusion even stronger each time. No, through what Christ did on the cross, through all those wounds of his, as the Bible says in the Old Testament, in the Gospels, and in the New Testament, by his wounds, we are healed. By his wounds, we are healed. That's Christ has made provision for healing, but we need to believe it. We need to believe it. And by believing it, that might mean for a while that you are believing in your heart, but thanking him every day by your stripes, Jesus, you've made provision for me to be healed. And Lord, I speak it out in faith, not having received it experientially, but Lord, I speak it out in faith that by your wounds, by your stripes, I am healed. And I'm just waiting for my body to catch up with what I'm speaking out. By your stripes, I am healed. And friend, if you keep that up, guess what? You step by step, confession by confession, you will move out of whether sickness, poverty, whatever. I have proved that over 37 years. I'm, I'm, there's things in my body right now I'm believing God for. But friend, I've seen him been so faithful to his word in my family's life, in the past. Amen. So I, it's, it's experience, faith to faith. So I just want to open up this, uh, this area here of the platform. If you have, in fact, if, yeah, if you want to avail yourself of the opportunity, it would be my great delight to lay hands on you, okay? And we will believe God. I've already prayed for people this morning.